Good evening, everyone. Uh, greetings from Florence, the birthplace of Mikhail Angelo uh, at the ATTD 2024. It's, it's an absolutely wonderful conference talking about innovation in, um, in digital technology, in therapeutics, uh, and aspects of obesity management, and much more. Um, I must thank all of you for finding time and joining in today for our the symposia. And I'm going to be giving you some highlights and update of day two, uh, ATTD 2024 from Florence, Italy. All right. So the table of contents of today's conversation is going to be talking about pharmacological interventions with dual and triple hormone receptor agonists in obesity, an update on weekly insulin icodec, an overview for the trials and, and the way for the future. Um, some interesting uh papers that were presented here, which is about uh, addition of empaglifosin to patients on the pump in type 2 and how that's fed, and and uh, an aspect of uh, uh, improvement in glycemic outcomes in, in type 2 diabetes, the 14-day personalized coaching, uh, which was my uh, oral poster presented here earlier uh, uh, yesterday. So we start with the uh, the talk from uh, Michael Camilleri, who spoke about the pharmacological interventions with dual and triple hormone receptor agonists and obesity. Well, we, we understand today the complex interaction of nutrient intake and neurohormonal response, as we can see and appreciate that, you know, arrival of mono and disaccharides in the upper GI tract will stimulate and lead to release of GLP-1 from the intestinal mucosa and insulin from the pancreatic beta cells. Arrival of nutrients then in the more distal small intestine and colon is associated with release of several other peptide hormones, GLP, uh, PYY, oxytomondulin, and neurotensin. Now, when we talk about the aspects of strategies directed at managing being overweight or obese, uh, there are multiple different uh, uh, approaches that, that we know uh, which have been tried right from the surgical aspects of, of gastric bypass surgeries, the Roux and Y surgery, the stapling, and so on, uh, the gastrectomies, to the use of drugs, which have tried to target different uh, positions. So we knew the earlier drugs, which was bupropenone and naltrexone, or a combination of fentramine and topiramate available in some parts of the world. Uh, limited results, though, and, and, and very often not preferred because of the side effect profile. Well, SGLT2 inhibitors, not really weight loss drugs, though some patients do achieve reasonable weight loss because of, of glycosuria and loss of calorie from there. And then, of course, you've had the GLP and the GLP, GIP co and the future, which is triple agonist and much more, which are largely going to be looking at uh, increasing satiety, uh, focused on, on, on the appetite regulatory centers in the hypothalamus, uh, and also trying to reduce insulin sense, uh, reduce insulin resistance and directly and indirectly contributing towards weight loss aspects. So when you talk about currently approved incretings, whether it's for management of type 2 diabetes or some of them for weight loss, well, what is the spectrum that we have? Started with exenatide, bieta, not used much now. Then you have the long-acting GLP-1 RAs, the relatively long-acting one, let me say, um, liraglutide, uh, Victoza. We also have the generic versions available in India now. Then you have semaglutide as once weekly subcutaneous injection or semaglutide oral, which we have in India, uh, which has been approved for, 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 for management of diabetes. You have dulaglutide uh, and then you have exenatide extended release. Again, not available in India, but you have dulaglutide as once weekly injections. Um, you have the long acting ones. We mentioned about semaglutide oral. Uh, which is available, uh, works great in terms of glycemic reductions. So you look at the side effect profiles for the entire group, it's largely going to be similar related to GI aspects, uh, nausea, vomiting, hyperacidity, diarrhea, headache, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, tirzapatide. Uh, and we were extremely happy to be associated in two of the tirzapatide trials from our center uh, in Mumbai. Uh, and today, that's, of, of course, approved as Munjaro, not yet available in India, but hopefully in the near future it would be. Um, a drug which is shown, which is approved for, for glycemic control in type 2 diabetes. Um, it's on a fast track by the US FDA for review for obesity, not approved yet for obesity, but 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 the results on weight have been uh, better 
than any of the other approved drugs so far. So uh, this this should uh, get approval for obesity as well. Uh, and a way to go about tirzepatide is actually starting slow and, and then up titrating. So 2.5 milligram weekly. And then after four weeks, you go up by 2.5 from 2.5 to 5, 7.5, 10, 12.5, and eventually 15. Uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully, the patients are able to admit. And I must say, in my limited experience in the trials, the side effect profile for tizapatide seems to be much lesser than the other GLP-1 RAs that we've, we've used so far. So hopefully, uh, that's uh, what we continue to see in the real-world practice as well. Now, one of the other important aspects that the, that the uh, GLPs or the incretins largely work by is by slowing the gastric emptying. And we know the slowing of GE is associated with weight loss. So if you look at the data for uh, liraglutide versus placebo, uh, and you're trying to see the effect of treatment on gastric emptying, we clearly see the difference between baseline and as the weeks progress for, for, for drugs like liraglutide, and you see no difference in the placebo arm. Sorry. Right. Um, you also see a relationship uh, of change in gastric emptying uh, to change in weight at 5 and 16 weeks in, in both the groups uh, when you try and see the data from uh, the earlier GLP-1, which is liraglutide. We move on from understanding the basic function of GLP-1 on gastric emptying to the uh, what the future holds in this. And these are the triple agonists we're talking about, which is uh, glucagon uh, uh, agonist along with GIP and GLP, so GIP and GLPRA as well. Uh, this is under investigation for, for maintaining weight loss. More potent at the human GIP receptor, less potent at the glucagon and GLP receptors compared to the native versions, uh, and which is which is similar for the GIP GLP also. When we talk about tirzepatide, it's predominantly more potent at the human GIP receptor and less at the GLP-1 uh, uh, receptors. Half-life is approximately six days, so it supports the once weekly dosing. In adults with diabetes, uh, in all the data which has been presented so far, retroclutide actually reduced A1C and weight versus placebo and, and, and other comparator, active comparator being dulaglutide 1.5 milligram in the 12-week trials. Um, it also shows slowing of gastric emptying. Uh, they usually use acetaminophen in the liquid form to study the impact of gastric emptying. Um, and we can see that it slows gastric emptying with little tachyphylaxis as we see. So the effect remains uh, persistent uh, uh, for gastric emptying. And you have data of gastric emptying assessed from day two, uh, going up to day 79 for, for a, a cytomenophen. And we're seeing that the effect persists at the end of this period as well on gastric emptying. Well, so we look at the data for the retatrodite phase two trial for obesity. And we see for participants with the BMI of less than 35, uh, you're seeing the, the impact of retatrodite again, uh, up titrated from one milligram to four to 8 milligram uh, and finally 12 milligram. So you see the data uh, which is dose dependent for the BMI uh, for percentage change in body weight and you see up to, uh, uh, um, you're seeing here uh, almost a 20% uh, weight loss uh, uh, in, in the higher dose strengths. Even for patients who had a BMI of more than 35, you see a little more pronounced results going up to a 26 uh, 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 percentage weight reduction uh, at the end of this period. You also see uh, in terms of male and female, uh, female participants doing probably a little better than the male participants in this study. The adverse events with retatrodite, again, uh, dose related, mostly mild to moderate in severity and partially mitigated by starting with the low dose, which is to one to two uh, as compared to the uh, higher strength of four milligram. Then another interesting drug ahead is cagrilintide. Uh, again, the dose titration is from 0.3 to 4.5 uh, once a week for 26 weeks with lifestyle intervention. And you again see dose-dependent weight loss in overweight or obese uh, adults. This was their phase two randomized control trial. And we see the data for cagrilintide dose-related response on the body weight. Uh, and, and we see the, the, the difference, uh, estimated mean change in, in body weight from baseline to week 26. Um, in terms of side effect profile, again, similar aspects of nausea, vomiting, constipation, and diarrhea. So GI side effects, but we see 
not much of a difference if at all lesser side effects than than liraglutide 3 mg as in comparator you're not talking about lira 1.8 but lira 3 um, and as compared to lira 3 you're talking you're seeing caglutide having less effects less 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 side effects and which is where today you're also seeing aspects of caglintide. You're going to be looking at aspects of combination of caglintide and, and Icodex. So Ico, uh, no, you have Ico uh, Sema and you have Cagri Sema as, as two other products in the pipeline that, that uh, uh, Novo Nordisk is working on. So caglintide with Sema uh, is what uh, we're showing some data here. Once weekly for management, this is the phase 1B randomized clinical trial data. And we see again, the mean weight loss uh, uh, on a weekly basis to be far more uh, pronounced in the Cagri Sema arm there compared to just placebo and semaglutide. So you're trying to see, I have semaglutide in one arm and then you're having Cagri and Sema. The Cagri Sema arm doing much better than just semaglutide itself. In fact, there is uh, there is another trial which is starting, which is going to compare Cagri Sema's effect on, on weight loss and A1C as compared to tirzapatide, which is an approved drug and probably seems to be the best in the class in the market so far. So Cagri Sima versus Tirzapatide will be again an interesting trial for us to watch out for in the future. There are, of course, other experimental and dual triple receptor combinations available. Huge body of work going ahead in, in this direction. You're looking at novel GLP and glucagon agonist, the quota dutide. Uh, you're looking at GLP glucagon agonist, pemblutide. Um, again, multiple different products from from various companies uh largely uh looking at at uh, reducing the energy intake uh, controlling the satiety improving uh, uh, the gastric and emptying effects and through these essentially looking at at causing weight reduction and an improvement in metabolic parameters so let me conclude the first part of what I was speaking on, that new pharmacological agents really impact obesity. Uh, and we often are having the discussion that in the future, uh, probably bariatric surgery may not be uh, as strong an option as, as the pharmacological uh, drugs towards weight and, and obesity management. Uh, several dual and triple agonists and, and more to come as we saw in the pipeline, and even some interesting combinations of incretin, uh, agonist and antagonist also. Important central effects on appetite with retardation of gastric emptying possibly increases the satiation and, and further enhancing weight loss. GI adverse events are significant um, and require proactive management, though I would go ahead again and say uh, in that limited experience in the trials with, with these, they still seem to be lesser than the older GLP-1 receptor agonists that we've had a chance to use so far. I move from there to the second aspect of the talk, which is update on weekly insulin icodec. Uh, something that, that Novo is also expecting an approval for in the near future. And, and, and hopefully uh, in the next six months to eight months, we'll have this product available in India also. So this was Julio Rosenstock who presented the data here at ATTD, uh, taking us through the journey of, of insulin innovation from the earlier NPH insulin to the first generation basal insulin analogs, which actually were path breaking in terms of uh, acceptance of insulin therapy and changing the scenario to longer acting basal insulin analogs, uh, ones which were genuine more than 24 hours, whether it is Degludec or U300 Glargine, and then moving to once weekly basal insulin uh, analogs. Uh, you have uh, FC4I and Icodec in, in the, the making and the trial process. Now, we focus uh, on, on why. Uh, we need this weekly insulin, what would be the advantage? Well, there are some aspects of one's daily basal insulin, uh, which we know can be limitations in cons inconsistent injections by our patients every day. Um, persistence and adherence are issues with daily insulin. Traveling, forgot to take it, uh, just forgot today, too, too tired, slept off, and multiple reasons. The treatment burden could be also high, an injection every day. Uh, try talking to your patient today, about the option between once daily injection and once weekly self-injection. Obviously, everyone will jump at uh, as fewer injections as possible. So which is where the once weekly basal insulin seems to again be a technological uh, breakthrough, which will require fewer insulin injections. Fewer uh, insulin injections may increase persistence and adherence for the patients, uh, decrease treatment burden, 
and weekly insulins may 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 consistently improve further glucose control if the compliance and adherence is, is better so let's look at look closely at insulin icodec what is uh, the structure so you basically have three amino acid substitutions to the human insulin uh, uh, structure uh, these three amino acid substitutions as as listed uh, in in the diagram one on a chain and two at b chains uh, and of course removal of of uh, b30 amino acid is giving more molecular stability reduced enzymatic degradation and slow receptor mediated clearance essentially trying to make the insulin work for a longer period now this of along with this through uh, a spacer it is attached to a c20 icosin fatty diacide change which is responsible for causing strong reversible binding to albumin and reduced re receptor mediated clearance and if you largely see the history and and the technology used by novo nordisk in in increasing the uh, the the duration of action of whether it's their glps or insulin they have largely relied on albumin binding uh, and that's been their forte for for their other products as well so here as well these characteristics are leading to a half life of more than uh, approximately a week which is at, achieved largely by causing these specific modifications to the human insulin be it the amino acid substitutions or the 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 attachment to the c20 uh, icosin fatty diacid chain now this is icodec is 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 one which has again gone through a robust uh, phase 3 a clinical trial program which is called the onward series uh, whether it's been comparing uh, icodec and non-insulin glucose lowering therapy uh, to glargine uh, or it's been comparison to uh, uh, degludec uh, or it is icodec used with the apps as compared to one daily basal insulin analogs um, whether it is basal bolus so icodec and aspart uh, as compared to glargine and, and aspart onwards for again uh, we in in Mumbai at, at the Brahma Kumari's BACS hospital were involved uh, in the onwards four trial uh, and I'll be sharing some of the uh, data uh, which was presented also of course by, by Julio Rosenstock today. So when you look at the onwards one program which was um, a, a trial easy to understand as to start off which was Icodec uh, versus Glargine uh, uh, Glargine daily versus Icodec once a week as we see at the end of uh, the period we uh, you're looking at the mean insulin dose for glargine. If you look at the total weekly dose, it was 222 units, uh, which was 32 units per day. Icodec was 214 units per week, which was 31 units per day. It's almost similar uh, uh, insulin requirement when you see that. And, and we can appreciate the, uh, the, the profiles are kind of superimposed for Icodec once weekly as compared to glargine uh, uh, U3, uh, U100. You also look at the A1C changes. Again, we can see a parallel reduction. Um, well, estimated mean A1C at, at the end of the trial, 7.1 in the Glargine group as compared to 6.9 uh, in, in the Icodec group. Uh, change from baseline A1C, as we can see, a 1.55 reduction for Icodec uh, uh, as compared to 1.35 in the Glargine U100 group, which was found to be statistically significant, a difference between the arms for A1C. The totality of glycemic evidence for Icodec versus Glargine 100, well, meaningful reductions in A1C from 8.5 to, to 6.9, uh, sustained reductions in A1C to 6.9 after 78 weeks, 72% versus 67% time in range from 70 to 184 Icodec. So again, having a little advantage in, in the newer metric TIR, which is seen in trials as well. 58 versus 45, achieving A1C target of less than 7. So almost 58% patients in the Icodec arm, 45 in the Glargine arm. Uh, so again, uh, Icodec doing well there. 53% um, uh, versus 43 percent less than seven. So overall, observed rates of a combined clinical significant and severe hypoglycemia are less than one event per per patient year for both the arms. Uh, greater A1C reductions from baseline for Icodec, lower rates of level two or three hypoglycemia, more patients achieving the target A1C of less than seven percent. Finally, superiority for for Icodec when you look at the data from onwards five for Icodec versus Degludec. Uh, superiority in A1C reduction again, significant improvement in treatment satisfaction and compliance scores. Overall, low rates of hypoglycemia for Icodec, even as compared to 
Deglutech. So clearly, Icodec is not only once weekly, but showing us better results as compared to all the existing uh, uh, insulin options. Overview of the completed Icodec phase 3A switch trials. You can see that from uh, 2 and 4 as well. Uh, and, and and we see, uh, sorry, we, we, we see uh, these were the, the, the uh, primary endpoints of A1C change in onwards 4 uh, and, and the same HB A1C change in onwards 2 for, for both of these uh, uh, trials, which were the switch trials. Uh, and onwards 2 and 4, switching to weekly Icodec in basal insulin or basal insulin treated at type 2 patients. This was the titration algorithm. Uh, which was used that if patients were on target of 80 to 130, there was no change. Those who were higher, there was plus three units in the Glargine or Deglutec arm. For, for Icodec once weekly, it was plus 20. And these are numbers which we'll get used to once the drug gets approved in terms of how do you titrate the once weekly insulin. But this was a titration algorithm. Similarly, for uh, uh, hypoglycemia or lower SMBG less than 80, you had minus three and minus 20. You see the A1C changes over time at week 26 and clearly Icodec uh, uh, doing a, a better than Degludec, and even in terms of absolute numbers, 0.93 in Icodec arm as compared to 0.71 in the uh, in the Degludec arm. Uh, you're looking at onwards four, which is what we were involved with, as I said, um, and you see the 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 uh, comparison of Icodec and Glargine 100. You're seeing similar A1C reductions here, 1.16 and 1.18. So Icodec doing similar to Glargine 100, but doing a little better than Degludec in, in their studies itself. Consistent top-line data on A1C reduction in hypoglycemia risk. So if you put all of this into perspective for, for ICODEC, huge program, but we're seeing consistent reductions in A1C and lesser hypoglycemia as compared to the, the comparators, be it Glargine or Degludec, across this program. Composite A1C less than 7% without level 2 and 3 hypoglycemia adds to the, the advantage for, for ICODEC, uh, which we await. So Dr. Julio Rosenstock's last thoughts were weekly basal insulins have uh, potential to become transformative for, for type 2 diabetes insulin management. Uh, personally, I, I, I don't know why it's stuck with the FDA approval, but hopefully it, it gets through uh, and, and, and our patients are able to get this once weekly insulin and, and use it to their advantage. Quickly, um, this was an interesting study uh, presented here. For patients who are already on uh, insulin pump therapy with type 2, uh, addition of SGLT2 inhibitor like empaglifosin actually showed uh, that when you do that, you are uh, improving. Uh, so empaglifosin added to insulin pump treatment showed improvement in glycemic control, the C-peptidogenic index and insulin dosing in patients. Also, the therapy stabilized BMI and of course, EMPA offers uh, benefits on the renal function. So an interesting concepts that your patients on, uh, on, 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 uh, insulin pump uh, or insulin multiple therapies. If they are not on SGLT2, you could consider that. This was our, our uh, e-poster, which also was an oral poster, which I presented, which spoke about significant improvement in glycemic outcomes in type 2 diabetes patients, the impact of 14-day personalized coaching and CGM. Today, we have a lot of digital therapeutic options available. Well, this is this was uh, data presented for one of those coaching programs from SugarFit, which showed that when you look at even the 14-day period as compared to the first three days on, on looking through CGM and then patients given personalized coaching, by the end of the 14-day period, there was an improvement in TIR and estimated A1C uh, as well. So with that, I, I thank you all for, for joining into this uh, Sahi Summit from, from ATTD. And, and thank you for having us here and see you all soon. Bye-bye.